to the BE Works Earth Day Sustainability Webinar. My name is Warda Malik, and I'm BE Works' newest CEO. It's a great honor to be leading the company after a decade of having joined the team. Behind me, I have the images of where it all started. The pictures from our tiny office facing the beautiful views of the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Looking back, I joined BE Works as a third employee with Kelly Peters at the helm. We had an ambitious goal to become the global leaders in applied behavioral science. At the time, we would joke that we didn't even truly know whether BE actually worked. I would say now, seeing what we have accomplished, that it most certainly does. Over the past decade, however, we have seen the evolution of our financial systems, a rise in cryptocurrencies, a global pandemic, and an ever-growing climate crisis. The need for behavioral science has never been more apparent. How will we approach the challenges that lie ahead of us when we're truly racing against the clock? How will we move beyond feel good to do good? One thing is for certain, our commitment to sustainability must include with it a commitment to truly understanding the psychological and physical systems that get in our way. Much as we have seen movements to unbias our discriminatory practices and organizations, so too must we inspect the biases, the heuristics, and the context that allow us to remain short-sighted or maintain our self-concept as green consumers without actually delivering on it. The session today with my colleagues are dedicated to exploring the ways in which we can deliver on this urgent need using techniques grounded in behavioral science. The success of our work will depend on the inquisitive clients and partners who want to deliver sustainability solutions that actually make a difference on both the consumer and the bottom line. This means exploring new business models, thinking unboundedly about what our future ambitions could be, and then working towards accomplishing them with behavioral science as the foundation for change. It's with great pleasure that I introduce you to some of the sustainability leaders at BE Works who have been thinking about these challenges and applying a new lens to tackling them. With some of the world's largest brands, these are my colleagues, Dr. Dave Thompson and Dr. Angela Cooper, who both co-lead our sustainability portfolio. Dave Thompson holds a PhD and is a vice president of strategy at BE Works. His PhD is in experimental cognitive psychology from McMaster University. At BE Works, Dave oversees large behavior change projects aimed at driving sustainable behaviors amongst consumers, citizens, and employees. In overseeing the sustainability portfolio at BE Works, Dave helps companies and governments create and validate behavior change programs that are aligned to the UN sustainability development goals by focusing on the psychological barriers to the adoption of sustainable behaviors. Angela Cooper holds a PhD in linguistics from Northwestern University in Chicago, which was supported by a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada doctoral fellowship. At BE Work, she leads the team which helps uncover the psychological barriers to behavior change. She has led numerous projects across multiple domains including a multi-year initiative to develop and validate a behavior change program aimed at reducing household food waste. This sector experience includes running, their sector experience includes running large scale field experiments to explore the levels beyond information and incentives to drive sustainable behavior change. In our agenda today, Dave will explore some of the universal barriers impacting sustainability initiatives and how to actually design them for impact. I'll follow that with a discussion with Dave and open up a Q&A uh, for everybody to jump in as well. Following that, Angela will walk us through a powerful case study of our work in action with Hellman's Unilever with the mission of reducing household food waste. I will be leading a discussion with both of them and I'm happy to facilitate any questions you might have in the audience. Please feel free to include them in the chat. We will also be recording this session and sharing it back with you in the coming days. With this, I now turn it over to Dr. Dave Thompson. Thanks, Warda. 
So as Warda mentioned here at BE Works, we're really in the business of behavior change. And I don't think it's controversial to say that when we're talking about sustainability, both now in the present and in the short and long-term future, we're really shifting away from concepts like driving awareness around issues such as climate change and generating intentions in people to change their behavior, but rather focused on actual behavior change. And what is it that we are actually asking people to do, whether we're talking about our employees, consumers, or just our fellow citizens? There is a lot that we are asking people to do, both as governments and as companies. We're asking people to reduce their consumption of everything from energy to water and consumer packaged goods and services. We're asking them to reuse old products to participate in things like the circular economy. We're asking people to expend additional effort. We want them to divert waste from landfill, to sort it, to recycle it, and to compost it. And we're asking people to change the way that they shop and consume goods and services. We want them to purchase only sustainably sourced products. We want people to buy in bulk, to use refillable packaging, or buy eco-friendly versions of products and packaged goods. And there are a lot of other things that we're asking people to do as well. There's no one behavior that's going to get us to 1.5 degrees warming. And so how do we actually enable all of these different behaviors? How do we get people to abandon their old habits and adopt these new eco-friendly behaviors? It's not really about awareness anymore. It's not about forming an intention to do the right thing, to do right by the planet. And this is just one example I'll show you, but it applies to any number of these behaviors. 65% of consumers are saying that they want to buy from purposeful, sustainable brands when asked. But if you look at actual behavior, only around 26% of people are actually doing this. And this discrepancy between what people have as their values, what their intentions and motivations are versus what they actually do is mirrored across almost all of the sustainable behaviors that I just showed you. So what are we to do about this? when we're creating sustainability initiatives aimed at driving actual consumer behavior change. Well, at BE Works, this phenomenon is very familiar to us. It's called the value action gap. And behavioral economics is the scientific study of the factors that perpetuate this value action gap, our psychological biases, and our behavioral barriers that prevent us from acting in accordance with our stated values and our stated intentions. And there are many of these. And I wanna just give you a few examples of some of the core psychological biases that are resulting in this value action gap, this discrepancy between what we say we want to do and what we actually do in the realm of sustainability. So one example is that we are heavily present biased. And this phenomenon is sometimes referred to as temporal discounting. It simply states, and it's well-founded in the research, that we value immediate rewards over future rewards. And importantly, this is the case even when the future rewards are much larger than the present rewards. So given this bias, let's consider what I'm calling the sustainability value proposition. Whenever we're asking someone to change their current behavior in the name of sustainability, whether it's turning down their thermostat or using less hot water, we're asking them to give things up in the present, whether it's comfort, convenience, time, money. And what we're asking them to do is give these things up now so that in the near or distant future, they can get rewards such as collective environmental benefits, maybe long-term cost savings as a result of behavior change, or just a general feeling good for doing your part for the planet. So we have to consider that when we create a sustain, sustainability initiative, the behaviors we expect people to do, if it involves giving up a lot now for a future benefit, we're gonna be running up against present bias. And when we do that, we can expect to see this value action gap. Another example is simply that we are boundedly rational. This is a phrase from behavioral economics, which states that when we undertake decision-making on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, we are constrained by time and mental energy, right? So in order to behave sustainably, again, if we think about the sustainability value proposition, 
We're asking people to make complex comparisons, to override their habitual or, or default choices, and to expend additional uh, mental energy. And this is the case whether it's, it's about waste sorting and recycling, or using eco-friendly settings on appliances, or shopping for more eco-friendly alternatives to products and services. We do not have the desire or the ability to engage in every single moment-to-moment -moment decision in an effortful, deliberative way that allows us to make these complex decisions. So instead, we rely on mental shortcuts, heuristics, we fall back on old habits. So we have to think about the context in which we're asking people to change their behavior. Is this something that's likely to run up against bounded rationality? And if so, we can expect that even if people want to engage in these behaviors, the follow through might be a bit disappointing. And again, we'll see this value action gap. One final example is that incentives are often misaligned in the realm of sustainability. A lot of sustainability messaging up until now focuses on a very rational, explicit value proposition to people of what they should do and why they should do it. How our behaviors right now are negatively impacting the planet and how if we change our behaviors, we can mitigate climate change and better serve the planet. And these work in terms of generating awareness and, and making an emotional connection with people so that they form intentions and desires to change their behavior. But when we think about the incentives of the, the companies that are selling us their goods and services, think about the messaging that we see in the moment, in the moment of purchase, when we're in a store or when we're online, it's completely contradictory. On the one hand, we're being told to conserve and consume less. And then in the moment, we're being told to spend more money, buy more things to get free shipping or to buy more items to get additional items for free. And when we're conflicted with this mixed messaging, we often are going to behave in accord with what's happening in the moment, what the choice architecture is telling us to do, which is often not in line with our environmental goals. So again, when we're thinking about the success of sustainability initiatives, we have to think about how we're affecting the choice architecture to drive sustainable behavior change and not just using messaging to try and convince people that they should behave sustainably. Now, these are just a few examples. There are many psychological barriers and biases that perpetuate the value action gap in, an, in a large range of sustainable behaviors that will need to change for us all collectively to minimize our carbon footprint. And we're going to have to do this very soon. Addressing these psychological barriers will be critical. In order to achieve 1.5 degrees or revert some of the damage that we have and will do to the environment, 25% of the necessary CO2 reductions are gonna come not from changes in manufacturing, distribution and transportation costs, but lower in the value chain. It's going to be from consumer behavior change. And in order to realize that consumer behavior change, we can't just rely on messaging. We have to address the underlying barriers that are creating this value action gap. By and large, people are already um, interested in changing their behavior. They're motivated, they're aware, but for some reason they're not following through. Now, a lot of companies are trying to affect change right now, and some are doing it in quite innovative ways. And many of them are aligning their corporate sustainability campaigns to the sustainable development goals outlined by the United Nations. So I'll give you a couple of, of quick examples. We're seeing a lot of investment, a lot of marketing, a lot of advertising in actually enabling consumers to follow through on their stated values and intentions to behave, to behave more sustainably. So we're seeing companies like H&M with their clothing recycling programs. You can take your old clothes back to the store before you buy new ones and, have, and they will take them and recycle them, resulting in landfill waste diversion. And H&M and has actually invested over $100 million dollars in the research and development of the technology that allows them to separate the constituent materials from clothing so that it actually can be recycled. Similarly, large companies that have historically been criticized for their negative environmental footprint like IKEA have created the Second Life program where people can take their old furniture back to the store and contribute to the circular economy. And they have large amounts of their floor space devoted to showrooms featuring only secondhand furniture. We're seeing a lot of stores try and move away from single use plastics and offering people the opportunity to bring their own refillable packaging into stores 
as opposed to just buying um, packaged goods. And we're seeing coffee manufacturers now who all also have been heavily criticized for the um, the damage they do to the environment with disposable coffee pods. They have now created recycling programs, invested huge amounts of money in the, in the R&D to make this possible. And so now people can store their old coffee pods and mail them back or drop them off at the store to be recycled. But the question here when companies are making these initiatives really is if we build it, will they come? Is it enough to simply enable people to act in accord with their stated values to behave more sustainably? People are saying they want to change their behavior. And in order for that to be possible, yes, companies have to do their part and create options for people, give them the opportunity to follow through on those stated values. Well, a statistic from just a few years ago um, from a survey done by Bain and an analysis shows that only 2% of corporate sustainability initiatives are considered successful. Considered successful by the goals that the companies themselves put forth when they created these corporate sustainability campaigns. This is an exceedingly low number. And at least part of this is because we have largely been ignoring the psychological barriers that we must overcome to drive behavior change. We've been using a lot of messaging, marketing, campaigns, creating innovative new products and services to give people the choice to behave sustainably, but we're not enabling behavior change by addressing the underlying barriers and closing the value action gap. And as we move forward with successful sustainability campaigns, we're going to have to address that in order to increase this number. So how do we close that value action gap? Well, I've already made the point that communications alone will not be enough. They may serve to drive intentions, awareness, and motivations, which is an important first step, but we shouldn't expect that behavior change will follow from that. And as we described, many companies are going one step further, creating new products and services that actually enable the behavior change that people want to undertake. But again, we're still asking people to change their behavior, and we're still going to be confronted with the barriers that create the value action gap. Sustainability initiatives that are truly impactful and collectively work towards that 25% CO2 reduction we need to see on the consumer side are going to need to address the psychological barriers to action. We're going to have to overcome things like present bias, misaligned incentives, and bounded rationality, and many others as well, if we want to enable people to actually change their behavior in more sustainable ways. And in a few minutes, my colleague Angela is going to walk you through a case study of some recent work that we've done that puts these principles into practice to affect behavior change in the domain of food waste. And so I'll turn it back to Warda for we'll start a short Q&A. Perfect, thanks Dave. Um, I loved your what you covered about this contradiction of mixed messages. So now as more and more companies are starting to follow suit with a more circular economy type of model and are really putting sustainability initiatives front and center and I think very well intentioned and it is the right thing to do. Sometimes the fact that it is much easier to just go and with a few clicks of a button, get a product delivered to your door with a ton of packaging and then be told that, you know, it's more cumbersome to bring it back to their stores or to do the right thing, that very much does feel like a contradiction. And I think what we have discussed internally is just how easy it is to be a consumer, but how much more challenging and how much friction there is in the path of being a sustainable citizen. Um, so that was a really uh, great point. So to yeah, I think that in the, in the moment is where we need to get at people. Um, the intention is there, the motivation is there, um, but in the moment, if the easiest thing to do, the thing that you're, you're, being, you're being nudged to do is not the sustainable thing, then I think that's what we're, we're gonna see. Yeah, exactly. Um, so picking up on that thread, do you feel like it's perhaps hit or hypocritical for big companies to put the responsibility for sustainability on the consumer? Um, no, I don't think that it is. I think that um, there's a lot that companies can do to minimize env negative environmental impact, but they can't do everything. Consumers are still um, the end, like a large part of the life cycle of any product. And uh, a company can do many, many things in terms of reducing their energy and water consumption, minimizing their use on non-renewable energy, 
in the creation and distribution of their products, but they have very little control over what people do with it once it's in their hands. Um, I think it's, it's necessary for companies to show they're doing what they can higher up in the value chain to minimize the carbon footprint, um, but they still need to do something to drive consumer behavior change. And I think that if, if consumers are seeing that the companies are doing their part and trying to enable them to follow through on their actions, then that's a good first step. You know, we still have to overcome the psychological barriers to behavior change. It could be seen as hypocritical if companies are doing nothing and simply trying to pass the buck onto the consumers to put in all the effort. So the, the examples I showed are good examples of companies who are doing their part and now we need consumers to do their part. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I think um, one of the things that I mentioned in the opening was about moving beyond things that feel good to actually do good. And that's really brings up this topic of greenwashing. Um, and one of the things that Nina Mazar, who is a partner at BE Works and a professor uh, at Boston University. At the time that she did this research, she was at the University of Toronto, and it was many years ago, I was working in her lab, and she talked about green licensing. And this idea that when people do something green, they actually become more likely to be, be wasteful or to cheat in other domains, this sort of flexibility of feeling like we've done good. And I think that that sort of relates to this idea, the consequences of greenwashing, I think are very much related to that. Can you talk a little bit about what is greenwashing, why it might be dangerous and how behavioral science techniques can help avoid that? Yeah, greenwashing is now getting a lot of criticism. People are aware of it. I think initially um, ESG and CSR agendas have been focused on showing that you're trying to do something positive for the environment, but the actual impact of it is negligible, zero, or even worse for the environment. And we've seen lots of examples of that. Um, adding material to products. You know, there, I think um, uh, Huggies, I think, was a brand that was criticized. They, they came out with an eco-friendly line of, of diapers. It was the exact same product as the non-eco-friendly one, but they just added on an extra piece of material that was organic cotton. Oh, so wow. that they could claim that part of their product, would, they could say that it was a sustainable product now. Mm -hmm. And I think now um, there's a lot of oversight. There are independent um, organizations and nonprofits like Just Capital that are, are paying attention to this. And they're, they're tracking and ranking companies against their claims and against their progress towards sustainability commitments. Behavioral science has a role to play because if companies can actually demonstrate that they're having an impact, not just on the products that the options that they're creating, but on the behavior change they're driving and the resulting carbon offsets that that results in, then you have no, no claims to greenwashing. And I think that, like I said, they have very little control over what consumers do at the end of a product's life cycle, um, creating products and services that, that capitalize on what we know from behavioral science. If they can actually affect change and that change can be measured, then I think you know, they're not going to be criticized for greenwashing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is a perfect segue into Angela's section, which is actually looking at um, one of the projects that we are extremely proud of here at BE Works, and it was work done with Hellman's Unilever, where they, in fact, you know, move beyond um, things that might directly benefit the sale of their product to say, how do we actually tackle this global issue of food waste? So over to you, Angela, to walk everybody um, through that case study. Thanks. Thanks, Warda. Right, and as Roya said, I, I want to talk to you all now about a concrete example of how we've approached tackling a sustainability challenge, specifically uh, a case study where we used flexible thinking uh, to reduce household food waste. And so just to provide everyone with a bit of context, food waste is a massive challenge with far-reaching monetary, social, and environmental consequences. And there's been considerable research done that's shown that nearly half of food waste actually occurs in the home. And almost two thirds of the food that's being thrown away by households is actually edible. So think about that banana that you may have thrown out that seemed a bit overripe or that 
half finished bag of spinach that was wilted and soggy and so you tossed. And because so much of the food waste problem is occurring in people's homes, this is an area that is ripe for behavior change. And so, you know, as Ward has already said, Unilever has made a commitment to taking action on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, transforming how they operate their businesses in a more sustainable way, but critically also by developing and putting into action purpose-driven programs for consumers. And so to that end, and furthering their purpose-driven program around creating taste not waste, Hellman's partnered with BE Works and other collaborators to help them design a behavior change program to tackle this issue specifically around reducing household food waste for families. And so at BE Works, our approach uh, to challenges has always placed empirical data and experimentation at the forefront. And so we've engaged in a multi-phase iterative testing approach over the past two years now with Hellman's, gathering data to help the design and refinement of a behavioral program. And so the next important challenge to tackle when it comes to addressing really any sustainability challenge, but specifically food waste, is to consider where to devote one's efforts. So it's important to, to realize that food waste, as with many sustainability challenges, can't be distilled into a single behavior. We can't point to one behavior that's the culprit because in fact, there's a chain of different behaviors that can turn food into waste, starting from making a plan for what you'd like to make or shop for, you know, how you purchase, how you store your food, how you prepare and consume your food, and ultimately whether you repurpose it. And so the two halves of this chain can be divided into preventing surplus from actually coming into the household and recovering food once it's inside the home. And so we could potentially intervene really at any of these behaviors. And so it was important for us to start with a discovery phase and diagnose where we felt we could have the most impact. And so we first wanted to understand the factors that actually predict food waste and ensure that these factors given the current global pandemic, were actually still key problem issues for people. And so we administered a survey to over 2,000 individuals in both Brazil and Canada. And we wanted to gather data about what their food behaviors are, their attitudes, their different barriers to optimal food management. And one of the main findings that emerged from this work is that some of the key factors that we found to predict household food waste estimates this included things like forgetfulness, so how often you forget the food that you already have. Things like food cosmetics, so how often you throw away blemished food. And just lacking the time and energy to figuring out what to cook. And so you'll notice that all of these factors, they tend to occur in and around the home at mealtime. And so this allowed us to narrow our focus on food recovery. And so with our focus now narrowed to food recovery, we then ideated on a number of possible interventions to help people recover the food that they have. But to do that effectively, we first considered, you know, what's the psychological journey that a person must go through in order to recover their food? So we posited it'd be a three-stage journey, you know, rediscovery, reevaluation, and repurposing. So in order to recover food, you first need to rediscover what you have. You can't use up what you don't know that you have. And as such, we hypothesize that increasing the salience or the visibility of spare food items in people's homes would help them recover the food that they have. But once you've seen it, you then evaluate whether you think it's still acceptable to eat. And so we know from the work I just mentioned, our diagnostics work, that there is this issue around food cosmetics. People have an aversion to blemished or unsightly food. And so we developed and tested strategies to help them overcome that disgust sensitivity. And finally, you know, once you've seen the spare food and determined it's acceptable to eat, you then need to figure out, you know, what do you wanna make with it? So these foods may have been purchased to make other meals and you're then left with a kind of random assortment of ingredients. And so we develop strategies to help people think flexibly and creatively about the food that they have. 
And so in a series of online experiments, we tested out the impact of these different interventions on the underlying mechanisms that they were designed to affect. So that is, you know, did the intervention that we designed, did it effectively increase salience or effectively reduce disgust, for example? And so this allowed us, by doing this initial testing, we were able to prioritize um, you know, which interventions would be most impactful to take with us uh, into field. And so with those interventions in hand, we now needed to create something that integrated them into a unified behavior change program. And so we created a program that highlighted two key steps in that psychological journey that I just introduced specifically rediscover and repurpose. So those were the two key behaviors that we were interested in driving. So we still provided folks with you know, tips to help them rescue their food if they needed support for that reevaluation, but the program featured behaviors that were centered on rediscovery and repurposing. And so one of the novel components of this program that we developed was that it didn't focus its attention on telling people they needed to reduce their food waste and how important it was to reduce food waste. Instead, it focused on something that might feel a bit more personally relevant for consumers and actionable for families. <clears throat> Specifically, that this program was aimed at helping them be resourceful with what they have and showing them how to do that. And so we tested a number of different ways that we could potentially increase the salience of spare food. So tackling that rediscovery stage. And so we know from the psychological literature that people's visual attention is drawn to things that are unusually shaped or brightly colored, especially if they don't have a clear target of what they're looking for in mind. So just imagine when you open your fridge and you're scanning the various ingredients that you have. If you don't have a clear target of what you're looking for, something bright will stand out. And so that motivated the design of providing a set of highly visible clips to tag food items that need to be eaten and a brightly colored basket where people could potentially collect food items all in one place so that their eyes are immediately drawn to them. We also tested a magnetic whiteboard tracker to be placed on the outside of the fridge where people could track the food items that needed to be eaten so that when they read that list and opened up their fridge, they now had a target to look for. And so that tackles our rediscovery stage. So now it comes down to how do we help people repurpose what they have? And our intervention there was designed at encouraging flexible thinking. And so to do this, we introduced the use of a simple rule of thumb that was termed the three plus one approach to shift how people were thinking about the food that they have. So to instead think about food as kind of building blocks for meals where ingredients could easily be substituted and used up. So the idea here is to help people consider different uses and combinations of food that they have on hand. And so we introduced this three plus one approach and also provided a small set of flexible recipes or flexipes, which exemplified this approach. So essentially, the idea here is that you start with a base. So these are kitchen staples like pasta or rice or eggs. And then you grab veggies and fruit that you need to use up, add an optional protein, and then finish all of it off with a magic touch, which could be condiments or sauce or herbs, just something to give the dish your personal stamp. And so with these interventions in hand, we now needed to test their impact on food waste. And so we deployed one of the largest randomized control trial studies of its kind to investigate the impact of these interventions on actually reducing household food waste. So in an RCT, people are randomly assigned to either a control group, so they receive no interventions, or a treatment group. And so our hypothesis was that providing a flexible way of thinking about food would allow people to use up what they have and ultimately reduce food waste. And as such, all of our treatment conditions received our flexipes and our three plus one approach. But we also hypothesized, if you remember, that helping people to rediscover what they have by increasing its salience might yield additional benefit. And so we tested three additional groups with the three, one of the three rediscover interventions that I mentioned. So either a set of clips, a whiteboard tracker, or a basket. 
And so all of these conditions were compared to our control condition, who received none of these interventions. And so the participants in this study were Canadian families, a representative sample across Canada, who had at least one child in the home, and where the respondent was responsible for at least half of the shopping and food preparation duties. And so we asked all of our participants, including our controls, to complete a weekly survey for five weeks. And this survey included a subset of a validated food waste scale that was taken from the scientific literature, as well as other questions on other food management behaviors. Where did they shop? How much did they spend? You know, how much did they cook from scratch? And so on. So the key requested behavior that we asked of our treatment participants was to simply pick a day once a week to make a meal with the food that they had on hand. And we gave them these, this three plus one approach and these flexibilities to help support that meal making. For certain conditions, if they were given a salience tool, we asked them to use that as well. And they were also asked to read sort of weekly tips on food management to help with that reevaluation piece. So that takes us now to the critical question, what was the impact? And so we tracked their self-reported food waste over five time points. As I said, this is every week for five weeks. And so we collected a baseline. So this is before any interventions. And then for four weeks where our treatment participants received and used the interventions. And what you're seeing here is the total average food waste in grams at each time point. And so what you'll see is that all groups started with roughly the same amount of food waste at the beginning of that study, at that baseline period. But what we see is that those who received our interventions, and that's depicted here in the colored lines in the graph, they significantly reduced their food waste over time relative to control participants who were shown here in gray. And in fact, households who received our intervention saw a 33% reduction from their baseline in self-reported food waste over just one month. Which is an amazing, uh, is an amazing amount of reduction and is actually one of the largest reductions that you see in food waste when you compare it to the other scientific research. And so what you also see from this graph is that all of our treatment groups were found to be equally effective. So that means that certain interventions like our salience tools didn't actually help people reduce their food waste above and beyond the use of flexible thinking alone. Because remember, we had one group that only received our flexible thinking intervention, and then three groups who received both that rediscovery, sort of increasing salience tool, plus our flexible thinking intervention. And since everyone behaves similarly, we now know that salience tool didn't add much. And so this highlights the critical importance to test for impact. Because, because we conducted this impact evaluation, we now know that developing and distributing physical tools to increase food salience would not be a good use of time or resources when this initiative is scaled up globally. And so this work underscores the importance not only of employing a rigorous impact measurement so you can help determine you know, where should you devote your resources, but to also demonstrate the value of your investment in your corporate sustainability in your corporate sustainability initiative in a defensible way. And so this work, which is, you know, the, the, the impact that we saw, which was amazing, uh, has already been scaled up and so to maximize its reach and potential food waste impact. So Hellman's has actually turned this validated behavior change program into a free digital app. So this app launched earlier this year in the US. Uh, it's also available in Canada. Uh, and if you want to do your part uh, to help reduce food waste, I encourage all of you uh, to, to log on to Hellman's website or your local app store and you can check out uh, this app and the program that we developed. Okay. And so just to, to sum up this particular case study, you know, fundamentally this research revealed that just simply choosing a day to use up spare food and also providing people an easy method to help think differently about that spare food drove behavior change. And in several follow-up studies, we've replicated these findings with a different population, through a different medium, so we can really be confident in the efficacy of the behavior change program. And the power of this program stemmed from first 
identifying well, what is the critical behavior that we want to drive, in this case, recovering and using up food in the home, and designing a program that went beyond just sort of telling people that they needed to use up what they have, but, but identifying well, what are the barriers, the psychological barriers, the contextual barriers to that behavior, and then providing them tools to help support that behavior. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Dave. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, that was an extremely um, amazing project to be a part of. And the, the impacts were larger than we expected. And, and again, the, the value of testing this out in a rigorous way with, with willing partners was key to being able to justify that expenditure, as you mentioned, and, and, and justify additional expenditure to scale this up and put marketing, advertising and PR um, force behind this. So it's, this is one example of how we can create behavior change programs that kind of cover the whole journey. We know that people have an intention and a desire to change their behavior. And when innovative companies enable that by creating products and services, we can go one, one step further. Um, but what we still have to do, which I talked about earlier, is address the underlying psychological barriers to follow through. And here um, in, in this work on food waste reduction, by using a data-driven approach to, to figuring out what those behavioral barriers are, we designed a solution that specifically addressed those and we were able to generate significant impact. It's our hope that in the near term, behavior change programs and corporate sustainability initiatives like this are not innovative exceptions, but instead become the norm. And there's increasing pressure for companies to do just that. Um, recent climate change conferences and the report just released a few weeks ago by the International Panel on Climate Change are really highlighting that in order to get that final 25% um, carbon reduction that we will need, it's really going to come down to behavioral science, behavior change, and getting people to change their day-to-day -day lifestyles. So behavioral science is really now in the spotlight in addressing that sort of final mile of the sustainability challenge. And if we zoom out even further and think a little bit more blue sky about what the future could look like in terms of enabling consumer behavior change in line with our sustainable um, goals and intentions, We'd like to see a sustainable choice architecture where the decision space, the environment and the context in which we live our lives is set up to enable sustainable choices and sustainable behaviors and not the opposite. Ideally, we'd like to make it just as easy to do what you see here, which is donate your, your old Calax shelf back to the IKEA Second Life program. And this is a screenshot from their their website. And again, it's not to criticize the Second Life program. It's, it's a good step towards enabling behavior change. But as you can see here, you're still asking consumers to do a lot of additional um, effort, time, mental energy, and expense. All you have to do, instead of putting your um, old furniture out on the curb, if you want to participate in the circular economy, is send them four or more pictures, um, allow five business days for an assessment, check your application status, uh, wait one more day, um, transport your fully assembled furniture to Ikea, get an Ikea family card, a unique application code, and then after all that, you, you can give yourself a pat on the back. On the other hand, to buy a similar product, it's one click. And, and we're seeing more and more companies adopting this one click buying. We're spending a lot of time making it easier for people to consume by changing the choice architecture to promote higher levels of consumption. And at the same time, we have all this messaging telling people, oh, you should consume less. So it's our hope that in the future, we can really leverage this idea of choice architecture to enable sustainable behavior change. Because as we've discussed, there are a lot of behavioral and psychological barriers that are preventing people from following through with what we are now aware of, motivated to act on, um, and even intend to act on. But when we see uh, choice architecture at the moment of purchase like this, all of those good intentions and motivations go out the window. And this is really what we need to move towards um, to see real impact in our corporate sustainability initiatives. And with that, I will turn it back to Warda to kick off our Q&A.
Excellent. Perfect timing, Dave, right on at 1245. Um, thank you, everybody, for submitting questions. I can see them in the chat. Uh, before we dig in, I just wanted to just elaborate a little bit on some of the things that Angela and Dave have been talking about today. Um, one thing in particular to take the Hellman's case as an example is this idea of flexible thinking. And we would have all um, seen, you know, the three R's of reuse, reduce, recycle. And we just, as an information tactic, have seen that out there over and over again. But this work and the work that we do kind of shows how difficult it is for people to think creatively about that reuse bucket or the repurpose bucket. And that there's additional work that needs to be done by companies that are using this approach to actually aid and support people in thinking creatively and flexibly about you know, the other ways that they could use packaging. Um, you know, what are, you know, it's, it's a cardboard box that you get, but perhaps there are other prompts on the box itself that can support people in how else could it be reused. So the lessons from the Hellman's project, I think can extend to other types of industries and products. And as leaders in sustainability in this session today, you know, we would encourage you to look at what your life cycle is and say, well, how else could we, if the onus is on the consumers and consumers do need to play a role, make it easier for them to think more creatively about how they can reduce the waste in the life cycle and the ecosystem that you know, your brand might have created. Um, we went to dinner last night to a wonderful restaurant that is all about sustainability. And that sort of brings up this other notion of some of these common defaults that we have. And we use the very simple example of, you know, we're used to peeling a carrot because it's just very much a part of the, the default or the process that we're in when in fact you don't have to create that food waste in the first place. Um, so very interesting, I think, for a behavioral science team to come in and sort of analyze where are these other defaults that are creating needless waste that isn't even required in the first place. Cool. So turning it over to the questions in the chat, um, I'm seeing stuff about, you know, did these behavioral interventions uh, did you do them in Brazil? Um, people from Malaysia are in the chat as well. I think it's important for us to maybe focus on some of the cross-cultural elements and looking at the food waste challenge, Angela, maybe you can speak to, do you think that they would translate more broadly in cross-cultural domains and, and what's an approach that you would suggest there? Absolutely. Um, and to answer that question about whether or not, you know, their intentions to do this in Brazil, um, absolutely. I mean, Hellman's aim with this behavior change program is that it's not specific to North America. They are already rolling it out, I believe, across the pond in the UK and have absolute intentions of, I mean, their goal, I believe, is to reach 250 million people worldwide. Um, and so, you know, the way that we approached designing these interventions was thinking about, as I said, that psychological journey, you know, and the idea there is that we'd hypothesize that that journey would apply to all people cross-culturally. That fundamentally, to recover food, you must go through those three steps of, you know, rediscovering what you have, reevaluating, and repurposing it. And, th and then thinking, about, well, how can we help support, you know, people along those different stages of that journey? And so I think, of course, it's an empirical question, uh, but we would argue that the efficacy of the fundamental core of that behavior change program, so just getting people to pick a day to use up what they have and giving them some kind of easy rule of thumb to help them support making that meal would generalize to other segments, other, not only just cross-culturally, but of course the focus of this, of this particular study was on families uh, because they're such high wasters, uh, high food wasters, but we would hypothesize that it would generalize to other segments of the population, like single individuals, for instance, because at its core, it's about kind of base uh, psychological functions and biases that we're trying to overcome, which we think are somewhat universal. Not to say that cross-cultural context can't have an effect as well, but fundamentally we're trying to drive underlying human behavior. Absolutely. Um, I think that the experiment that was done too was really wonderful because you were testing the sort of 
let's try everything from the flexipes to the baskets and try to tackle the behavioral barriers and the psychological barriers that we know are at play. And ultimately the work revealed that flexipes is the approach that was reducing food waste, not so much the salience, which were, would have required Hellman to actually invest in these baskets and, and, and pulled those out, which is another contributor to food waste. And so in a way it's aligned to their sustainability goals because before they are investing in other products and tools to support what feels like a good idea, um, the experiment sort of revealed where they can put their investment so that it has a bigger impact. Because you can see, you know, in what they rolled out, ultimately a digital tool, which has an impact is powerful versus you know, investing in a, a ton of baskets or other cues for, um, for salient. So I think that's a very powerful lesson. Are there any other lessons that you would generalize um, related to experimentation in the domain of sustainability? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that one. Um, I think that this type of validation, testing and impact evaluation is something that is, is not commonplace when looking at corporate sustainability initiatives. Um, the stopping point for this could have been the, the branding, the, the idea of the tool and the, the marketing that went behind this. Even the creation of the app itself could have proceeded. Um, but that would still be a very, very expensive undertaking. And at the end of the day, what you want to be able to say is the impact that you had. When we're talking about sustainability initiatives, the primary objective is not to increase product sales. That might be a secondary goal, but it's not the KPI on which these uh, programs are going to be judged. The, what they're going to be judged on is the impact that they've had. And you, you simply can't do it without testing. And so aside from the fact that testing can help you refine the finer points of the intervention, you know, what you, what you need to invest in to scale and what you can put aside, um, it lets you know as an organization what impact you are having. So by testing it with the right group of people, once it's scaled, we know the impacts that will be generated and you can extrapolate what the, what the overall impact to the planet is going to be by virtue of investing and rolling out a program like this. The experiment itself is not the impact that Hellman's and Partners and, and BE Works is trying to generate in the world. It's proof that this program works. It still needs to be scaled to have that impact. And the investment required to do that will not take place unless you can show exactly how big that impact is. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, at the start, Everyone had, a, had an intention to do that and, and thought that it was important. But I think the clarity of the results, the size of the impact um, were very surprising, got everyone very excited. Um, and this will be able to be claimed to be much more um, impactful because of that validation than, than anything that stopped purely at communication. So I think that's a lesson. Um, to be to be it's a model to be translated into other other behaviors, other realms of sustainability, and, and, and other companies as well. Yeah, and I actually think that experimentation in this domain is particularly important because of what we talked about earlier with greenwashing and green licensing. So just because it's a sustainability initiative doesn't mean that it might not backfire, and there can be backfiring effects as we've seen in studies that have actually gone out and studied this. When you provided the example of the diaper with you know, an organic layer or labeling that makes people feel like the product that they have purchased is green or you know, components of it are biodegradable, how might that actually increase wastefulness and you know, this backfiring on, I don't actually need to reuse it or dispose of it adequately. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth measuring that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, the resulting challenge we still have is now that we know that something like this can work um, and it's not just greenwashing, it does demonstrate measurable, observable impact. How do we create a new habit? 
we've got people to participate and we've shown that the core of this intervention is effective in doing what we want it to do um, and it can be scaled. And the next challenge I think for behavioral scientists working on these types of challenges is to figure out what's required to replace old habits um, and not make these one-off behaviors or short-term behaviors that make people feel good and then maybe engage in some of the, the moral licensing you talked about earlier where I've done my part now and I'm entitled to, to, to stop or you know maybe go do some other not so environmentally friendly things. Um, that is still largely uncharted territory here because you know we're still you know, even just in the realm of food waste there's been very little applied research looking at what you can do in terms of solutions in people's homes to get them to change their behavior. As Angela mentioned, this, this intervention yielded, you know, some of the largest impact of, of anything that has been tested. And now the next step, um, which we, we've been talking about a lot internally and with, with, with clients and partners is what will be the longevity of this behavior change and what would we need to change about this in order to drive a new habit among people. Yeah, absolutely. All very important things to measure and try to continuously nudge if we see that there is a decline or a possible backfiring that could happen. That's why, um, as I know we're all aware, the power of data collection and these types of initiatives is extremely important. Uh, I know we have a few minutes left and two questions. Um, Bruce, you asked about, you know, sometimes doing the right thing or the sustainable thing can be the costlier thing. It can be more costly to do that. Um, that's certainly a hurdle. And, you know, I don't think that behavioral economics or behavioral science alone is going to be the solution for sustainability. It's going to require a lot of broad sweeping changes and partnerships to make the right thing to do more affordable as well. Um, Cause that can be a hurdle in people's way. Uh, and then Anna asked this question of, uh, perhaps out of scope for this project, but do you have any sense of how the availability of municipal composting programs impacts food waste? It's something I've thought about a lot too. It's like, I don't feel guilty always throwing away food or the ends of food when I know it's going to be composted. And then, you know, hopefully somebody else will deal with it. So it's out of my purview because I've done my part, which is to put it in the right compartment and to divert it from the garbage bins. So have you guys read any research on uh, whether composting actually supports greener behaviors. Well, one, one interesting thing on that um, about this project is one of the very first data collection exercises we engaged in was just a general um, survey that Angela, met, Angela mentioned to get a sense of people's beliefs, attitudes, opinions, and current kind of self-reported household man uh, food management behaviors. And food waste is really interesting because there's a lot of things that people know unequivocally are bad for the environment and that they should change their behavior, right? Reduction of, and reliance on fossil fuels, single-use plastics. Food waste isn't one of those. M most people don't think there's anything wrong with putting food into um, compost, but it actually does have a, um, a negative impact on the environment, even, even when you compost. So this is, I think, a good example of... Um, you know, we could have simply focused our energy on changing that opinion and correcting that um, misunderstanding so, and thinking, well, if people knew it was bad, then they would stop doing it. But as we've seen in so many other um, domains of sustainability, that's just not the case. So instead, we decided, let's just enable behavior change and we'll worry about knowledge and awareness later. So I think, you know, it, it, that still might be part of the package of a solution like this is a little bit of education that even if you have a municipal composting program, that doesn't mean that this isn't for you and you, and, you, and there, there isn't room for behavior change for the benefit of the planet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. And thank you everybody that has tuned in today. I hope these insights travel with you and the work that you do, even if it extends beyond sustainability. Um, I encourage you to think about how your work moves beyond feel good to do good and how you might be able to run some experiments to measure the impact of the work that you're doing. 
Um, I encourage you to reach out to our team. Uh, we've put our emails up on the screen to explore how we could bring these insights to life within your organization. And I look forward to seeing you guys at, at more of our webinars and events in the future. Thank you all. Thank you.